Hey, if you, uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up with me to Judges chapter 17. Uh, we were going to try to cover the whole chapter, but we're just going to focus on the first five or six verses. Uh, before I read the text and we begin to work through it verse by verse, when I was in college, uh, my last semester at the Christian college I went to, I had a chance to go on a month-long mission trip. And so uh, we went to China because at the time in China, there was these orphanages where Basically, if a child was born and the parents just didn't want them, uh, they were just left in, particularly if there was something with special needs, they would just be in these orphanages. And so the Christians we knew had this really cool ministry, and it was the summer before the, uh, the Beijing Olympics. And while we were there, we ended up in this really rural area um, that was really outside of the metroplexes that we spent most of the trip in, a place called Zhao Shen. And when we were there, we had, I had a chance to go into a Buddhist temple. There should be a picture. You can't really see it because here's the deal. This was back in the day when your phone could not take pictures and you actually had, some of y'all don't know what this is, but like a, an actual camera that you could hold. And, um, and so you would take that camera and take a picture. And then I'm not very photography gifted. And so that's as good as I can get. But if you look really hard, you can see there's four or five statues there in the middle. And what you can't see is behind it, there's these little like cubby holes. And inside of each of those cubby holes is a tinier gold statue of that statue that you see right there. But the thing that wrecked me the most when I saw this is uh, were the mats on the floor. And the reason to me that was one of the most challenging things is I realized that there was an entire monastery filled with people that would go into this place and get on their knees and they would bow and they would worship these, these statues. Um, and I just realized that in the area that we were, just the number of people that not only don't know Jesus, but a lot of the people in that community had never heard the name of Jesus. And today we're going to talk about worshiping idols. And maybe you as a Western American, you think of that. Like you think that worshiping idols is what those people do on the other side of the globe who follow that other religion that you might know a little bit about. But what we're going to look at today is uh, there is a guy that worship idols like that, but I want to show you from Scripture how you and I also worship idols. And it's sort of a peculiar thing when you and I sit here and process that why would we give time and energy and money to fall on our faces to statues like that? And we can try to be judgmental of other religions who do that, but if we were being honest and really self-reflective, we would recognize the fact that you and I give time and money and energy to idols all the time. And what we want to do today is we want to look at the Word of God, and we want to look at that bad example of idolatry, and we want to check it on our own lives and hearts with the prayer and the goal to see if we do the same thing. All right, so starting off in verse chapter 17, we're just going to read the first five verses. We'll come back and read verse 6 in just a few minutes. Let's, let's read this. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke into my ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver and his mother. And his mother said, I dedicated the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it to a carved image and a metal image. And it was the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine he had made an ephod and a household gods ordained one of his sons who became his priest. Now we'll come back to verse 6. So let's just work through some of the details in the text. So the text seems to kind of just dive bomb into a family dynamic in their house. The narrative says there's a guy named Micah and Micah's mom. It's apparent that somebody has stolen a whole bunch of money from Micah's mother. Um, and, and because of that, it was 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, that would have been the exact amount that, if you remember from like two weeks ago, remember when Delilah betrays Samson for money, the 1,100 pieces of silver would have been the exact amount that she would have received from those governors. Now, some people speculate and say that Micah's mother is, uh, is actually uh, Delilah, but we don't know that for sure because the text doesn't say it. But here's what we know. Somebody stole a whole bunch of money from her. And she was so angry about it that she finally says, whoever stole that money from me will let them be accursed. Shortly after the cursing, Micah comes forward and says, oh, just FYI, just so I don't get cursed, it was me. 
And immediately after that, she praises her son, and then they do something that's kind of strange in celebration of God's faithfulness. They make a graven image and violate the second commandment. Now, I think a good question that we got to wrestle with is, is, was Micah's sorry, when he says, I'm sorry, was it genuine or was it not? A really good verse. If you guys, as you guys have relationships, because let's be real, we all have someone in our life that says, I'm sorry, and we're like, are you? <laughs> we're not really sure. Uh, a great verse that we need to know is 2 Corinthians 7. Here's what 2 Corinthians 7 says. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. So in other words, what, what Paul is saying there, he's saying there's really two ways that you can say my bad or I'm sorry. The first way is you see your actions and your thoughts and your words as first and foremost offense against God. And because it's offense against God, you feel deep sorrow and sadness over your sin. And repentance is a very simple biblical idea. Repentance means that you turn the opposite direction and you try not to do it again. Now, repentance would be great if we never did it again, but repentance is sort of the posture of your heart, that you hate that you did that, and you're going to put everything by God's grace and his power to not do that again. And the, that text says that when you and I have godly sorrow that leads to repentance, this is what salvation is. It's evidence that we've been changed by the gospel. But at the same time, it says that there's worldly sorrow which means that there are times that people can do something that are bad or wicked or hurtful to you, and they feel bad about it. But they seem to only feel bad about it for a short period of time. Because just in a few minutes or just a few days or even weeks, they are going right back to those same exact action, thoughts, and words. They don't genuinely repent of it. They feel bad about it, but they don't feel like sadness over it. They feel bad that it hurt you or affected you in the way that it did. But the second they can hustle things to go right back to it, they will. And so what this text is saying is, is when somebody has worldly sorrow, that always leads to death. Because they don't recognize that their offense was against God first and foremost. Which means they will just keep going back to the sin. So a good theological question would be, what's Micah feeling here? Is it godly sorrow that leads to repentance? Or is it worldly sorrow? From studying this text, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, that it's worldly sorrow. Here are some things in the text that I think indicates that. Number one, the writer of this chapter seems to imply that Micah does not admit he was wrong until there was the possibility of the cursing. So in other words, it's like he's stealing it, it's his, but then when he hears that there's the possibility that like judgment is coming his way because his mom has said, you know, I hope they go outside and break their leg or something, it's like he's like, oh my bad, I better make sure I get it back before I go outside and break my leg. In other words, this is an evidence of like worldly sorrow. It's like they're not really sorry. They're just sorry about some of the consequences that they might have to experience. And so because of that, he admits the fact that he stole it and he brings it right back. Another reason why I don't think it's godly sorrow is because the second he gets the money, he takes it and puts it in his little tabernacle and shrine in his living room. Now, we'll unpack that in just a few minutes, but, but he doesn't really seem to have any regard throughout this entire narrative to care about God's law or to want to submit his life to the truth of God. He is doing whatever he feels like is right in his own eyes. And he's even going to take one of his own sons and he's going to appoint them as like this, this priest in his private temple and tabernacle in his home which is just messed up. So I don't think he was really, really sorry because there's no pattern in his life that actually seems like he has a deep conviction and desire to know and follow what God has called him to do. And then you have the mother, and the mother seems like her head's in a better space than, than Micah, but the issue is there's also challenges with her because when she gets the money back, the first thing she wants to do is she takes the money and says, let's make an idol out of Yahweh, for Yahweh. And if you guys know your Bibles, you know in Exodus 20, the, there's the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, most everybody knows, you'll have no other gods before me. The second commandment is, don't make any graven images of me. And idol worship was extremely popular in the Old Testament. It's still popular in our hearts today. But the idea in the Old Testament was, is that you had these statues, wooden, gold, bronze, whatever, and you would come to that, and functionally what they believed was in their belief system, you could control God. That if you prayed to that idol in just a particular way, if you made the offering that it wanted, if you could come to that idol and do the things that were required of you, you could control a God to do the things that you wanted him to do. 
And so people loved worshiping idols because you felt like you could actually control things. And so as a result, you have this thing all throughout the Old Testament that the nation of Israel want to control God. They want, they're like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. It's like, like, if you eat this, you will be like God. And so what you discover is, is they always want to make idols and worship those idols. And the reason God was against them making idols is because the Lord is like, I don't fit in that silver statue. That manifestation of gold, bronze, or wood can't hold me or contain me. And when you come to that statue and you say, I worship you through that statue, God's like, I'm infinitely more glorious and amazing than that statue. So you can't contain me and you can't have any other gods besides me. And so as a result, God did not want them to make statues of himself. But the first thing the mom does is she takes 200 of the month, 200 of the shekels of silver and gives it to Mike and says, why don't you go make a, uh, a statue committed to the Lord? An ephod would have been a type of coat, a, a garment, a piece of clothing that the high priest would have wore in the tabernacle. And, and here's how broken everything is. He takes this graven image that's supposed to be a representation of God, and he puts it in his living room right next to other idols that are devoted to household gods, which means that Micah had accumulated other bronze, silver, and gold idols that worshipped gods that didn't have anything to do with Yahweh, which that implies that the time frame and the season of this, like, faith-based people of God is they've taken worldly ideologies and theology, and they've tried to synchronize it, sync it up, make it one with the Word of God and the law of God and the character of God. And just so you know, that doesn't work. And I know everybody will say, all religions are kind of the same. And I'm like, no. Like, yes, there are similarities. But, but what Jesus said is unique. I was talking to a group of teenagers today at an FC, this last week at FCA. And I'm like, if you believe Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one, you automatically, utterly reject every other faith system that pretty much exists except for Orthodox Christianity. And so what this, this whole point is, is that the action of making this bronze statue and putting it next to other gods that they believe exist in their living room, it just shows how broken and depraved things are inside of Israel, how far away they've gotten from the truth, that this is not just people of God struggling with sin. This is people of God who don't care that they're sinning, and they don't even care what God says. That's how far away from the truth that they've gotten and broken it is. It's terrible. Here's some things about idolatry, y'all. So when you read Exodus 20, that's not the only place that God says you shouldn't worship idols. But what I discovered this week in some of my reading is that when you violate the other Ten Commandments, don't murder, don't covet, don't commit adultery, that the other commandments hang on the first two commandments. So verse 3 of, of chapter 20 in the book of Exodus, says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, now here's what that means, y'all. Here's why this is so important. You and I as people were designed by God to love, serve, and worship Jesus. So we exist for the primary purpose of following Christ. But because Genesis 3 says that Adam and Eve sinned, instead of us doing what we were designed to do, we do the opposite of that. And instead of pursuing Christ supremely, you and I are prone to make idols. And instead of worshiping the Lord, we worship the idols. Here's the way Romans 1 says it. Romans 1 says that you and I as human beings have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And the lie that we've chosen to believe is that idols will satisfy us more than God. Idols will bring us more joy, more peace, more happiness, more security, more safety than the God of all things. And here's the way Paul says in Romans 1, because we've believed that lie, we have chosen to worship the creation itself rather than worshiping the creator who God is. And so if you're like me, you read this text and you're like, I've never done this before. Can we agree on that? Like you and I probably, I'm guessing, I'm assuming, unless you've come from other type of religious background, a Buddhist background or something, but, but most of us in this room from the rural south 
have probably never taken 200 shekels of silver, gone to a silversmith, I don't even know that I know a silversmith, and made a, a statue that you have put in your living room that every day you look at it and you celebrate the statue. But one of the major points that we have to take away from this text is we absolutely have idols. We struggle with idolatry every single day. Some of us every minute, every hour. In my reading this week, I I found some really great things that really helped me understand this idea of of idolatry. And I, I found an old church father, a guy by the name of Augustine, who said fundamentally worshiping idols is mis placed love. So you and I are prone to think about idols in a statue, but what Augustine says is, here's what idolatry is. Idolatry is when you and I love and cherish anything more than we love and cherish God. Anything. So when you and I want to serve or worship, give time, energy, and resources and money to a person or an object or an idea, that thing, whatever it is, is an idol. And here's what's tricky about idolatry, y'all. Anything can be an idol in this world. And sometimes it's very clear to identify. It's just sinful things, right? Like maybe that's greed. Like maybe it is adultery. Maybe it is something that is just crystal clear in scripture. And sometimes it's easier when it's like that. The most trickiest idols are the ones that might not necessarily be sinful. The things that are good, like a sports team, Or maybe a relationship or a lack of a relationship. Your kids, money, and lots of other things can be that way. And I read a section from a guy named Timothy Keller where he said, idolatry is when you and I build our life's meaning on anything, even if it's a good thing, more than we build it on God. And because when you and I create an idol, here's what Keller says, eventually you have to be a slave to that idol. Because everything that you want, the lie that we believe, is found in the idol, not in God. So we will devote our lives to this thing, whatever it is, to appease them. So when the Bible says we as parents should discipline our kids and correct them in order to push them to righteousness, if we idolize our kids and we want our kids to just like us, we won't do those things. We will appease them in passivity and feed them everything that they want and desire, which is ludicrous to do with a kid. Do you know what I'm saying? Because we don't do that with, I don't know, their homework. But if we do that with spiritual things, we just, we miss the opportunity. And here's what Keller says. This is like, blew my mind. I listened to it in a sermon yesterday. Here's what he says. He says, idolatry is sometimes a longing for something that's bad or evil. But then he said this, but it is also an oversized desire an out-of-order desire for something that's good. And what idol idol idolatry ultimately comes down to is, is when we say, I need X, whatever that X is, I'll have everything that I could have found in God. And instead of seeking those things in the Lord, we seek it in that idol. So let me give you just a really, really practical example that I think we all do this in some way, shape, or form. I think money is in this, like, way that we idolize things sometimes. Money is morally neutral. It is neither good nor bad. They might tell you differently. They're not like, when you read the New Testament and the Bible, God uses poor people. He uses rich people. God uses money in ways to leverage the church, and sometimes he uses the lack of money where he provides everything that people need. So money is neither evil or righteous. It's just money. But what we do as human beings is we take money and we make an idol out of it. Let me give you a couple of examples. We may look at money and say, that's where I find my safety and security. Maybe we're prone to say, I feel like I can have a peace about the future when I make a certain salary or when I get a certain amount of money in the bank account. I'm not saying we don't need to make a certain salary to meet our physical needs, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have a savings account. I am saying it's wrong when we feel like we can control the future and we can finally just catch our breath only when that thing is whatever it is financially. Or maybe for some of us, money means happiness and freedom. So we feel like we can buy what we want to buy and we can shop whatever we want to shop and the Amazon boxes keep coming are a wonderful thing. No shaded Amazon boxes. But the problem resides is when we say, I can only really be happy 
when I have the freedom to do whatever I want, however I want with the money that I have. Or maybe for some of us, money is about the status and respect of others. So we believe the more money I have, the more people will think how accomplished and successful and wonderful of a person that I am. And remember, money is not the problem. The problem is, is when you and I as Christians look to money for security or future joy or even joy as a whole or to be accepted by others instead of finding all of those things in Christ Jesus. Because here's where it all fleshes out. When you and I make an idol out of anything, we are prone to compromise God's truth to make sure we're always satisfying the idol. So just using the money thing, this is how that fleshes out with us. I think we're being honest. We'd all, it's hard to disagree. There are times that God wants us to be generous with our money. Maybe there's a need of somebody that we need just to give to. Maybe we need to give to a local church. God calls us to give to a local church, and we won't do it. And the reason we won't do it is not because we don't love our church, and it's not because we don't love that person we could be generous with, but we don't do it because our money is already spent on one of these idols. So instead of giving God the money that he's blessed us with in the first place in the way that he's called us to, we don't do that. Because money is my security, money is my value, money is my happiness. If I give it to this other area, I won't have those things, and I have to have those things. So as a result, we don't follow the Lord in obedience when it comes to our finances. And that's just one example. There is a million other ways in which we don't do the things that God has called us to because we're not following him and we've made an idol out of something in this world. So what I want to do over the next couple of minutes is I just kind of want to like, by God's grace, to just wrestle with what do we do with the idols of our hearts. Here's the first thing. You and I as believers need to identify the idols of our hearts. I said this a few weeks ago. You need to know the sin that so easily entangles you, and you need to know the idols that your heart is prone to worship and follow. Here's the way Keller says it. When it comes to sin, we need to not only know the sins that we need to avoid, but we need to know why we pursue those sins, is what Keller says. So sometimes preaching from the pulpit, and sometimes when you're reading your Bible on your own or a Bible study, there is an element that faithful teaching is saying, do not do these things. Avoid them. Pursue these things in righteousness that are good. But if we're not careful, we're going to give an entire, like, church a list of do's and don'ts and sometimes christianity is that right like i have an obligation with certain things with my wife and as a pastor that is do's and don'ts but that's not the best way to think about growing in christ because if you don't know why you have a propensity to avoid the things that god says that we should be pursuing then we're going to kind of miss the point of it And so one of the ways that you can begin to understand the why you're prone to sin in certain ways is to know the idol of your heart. And and I think a good starting point is to just not be in denial anymore. We we can't blame others for idols that are in our own lives. And maybe it would be good for many of us in this room to get alone with God and say, God, would you just bless me with some self-awareness of the idols of my heart? That it would be good for you and I to just own the brokenness so we can appreciate all that God has done for us. But one old reformer, church reformer during the Reformation said it like this, that our hearts are perpetual forges that constantly make idols. He goes on to say that every single one of us, even from the womb of our mother, are experts in inventing idols. So the question is not if you have idols. The question is what are they? And once we stop being in denial about that, the next step is we have to identify it. And I think it's healthy for us as Christians to name that idol whatever it is so that we can know what it is and say it out loud. Because remember, an idol is anything, anything at all that you love, serve, and worship more than you love, serve, and worship Jesus. Now there's lots of questions that you could ask to identify the idols. I just borrowed three from some of the research that I did that I think are helpful. So number one, If the thought of losing something or never attaining something leads you to despair, it might mean that it's an idol. Now, the Bible doesn't say despair is wrong. But the point is, is that when you have this thing in your heart that says, 
I'm going to lose my mind if this thing does not happen. Or if this thing does happen. Like, I'm never going to have peace. I'm not going to be good with God. I'm not going to be joyful unless this thing happens the way that I want it to happen. That could mean that whatever that thing that you're longing for is an idol. Or or here's another one. What are you most willing to sacrifice for? You, You know you worship it because you're willing to be inconvenienced by it. Maybe you even have moments that you're willing to sin to keep it. Here's another one that I found from a guy named J.D. Greer. He says, what, was, what has made you the most bitter or angry in life? Now, I understand that we struggle sometimes with God's plan and God's goodness. I think that there's a dynamic where God has grace for us in that. But the point that he's trying to make is, is maybe we're bitter about something because we've elevated to a point that we said, I need to get this or this thing needs to happen. And we're actually angry and bitter at life and God until that happens the way that we want it. And so there's lots of ways that we can identify the idols in our hearts. So once you stop being in denial and you identify it, here's the third step. This is an original me. I totally borrowed this from Keller. Here's what he says. You and I need to learn to apply to the gospel to that idol. This is so helpful, y'all. Like, we have to acknowledge that whatever you and I believe about that idol, that it will not satisfy us the way that Christ will. And you've got to apply the gospel and see where the gospel is better in every way for us rather than that idol. So going back to the money thing, if we say, if I just had more money, if my salary was a little bit more, then maybe finally I would be respected and revered and accepted by those people around me. Well, you don't know what you're saying this, but here's what you're fundamentally saying when you believe that, that your importance and value as a human being is rooted in your salary. It's rooted in your bank account. And here's why that's foolish. Because salaries change. Inflation goes up. It's a struggle for all of us, amen? And bank accounts go away. I mean, what else do, like, what better example right now than what we see in the Carolinas? It ain't just houses that are leaving. It is entire towns, roadways. I mean, we're so advanced in 2024. We're like, we're like sending rockets into space. And, and all of these inventions of men cannot sustain this hurricane that went through. So when you and I put our hope and value and importance as people and money and resources, they will always disappoint And here's how the gospel applies. We don't need to be accepted by people. We don't need our value rooted in what people think of us. What we need to realize is in Jesus, we are already perfectly loved and accepted. Because Jesus has said, you are my son, you are my daughter, because of what I've done for you on the cross and through my resurrection. So that means we don't have to do anything to earn love. We don't have to do anything to earn respect because in Jesus we have all that we need in him already. So when you and I are pursuing these endeavors because we want people to like us or love us, it's foolish because Jesus has already loved us and accepted us. Or maybe you're here and you're like, the security thing is what it is for money for me, you know? I need to make a certain amount and I need to have a certain amount in the bank account and I'm I'm always going to be anxious and I'm always going to be stressed until I get those things. But, but here's the challenge with that, is it sometimes doesn't fix the anxiety. And the more money you get in America, the more money you spend. And the more money you spend, the more money you get, you need. And so when we put our hope in the security of the future, we just, we miss the point. So instead of us saying, I feel safe and secure when I have more money, what we need to recognize the fact is there's something money cannot buy. Money cannot fix my longing and desire to have peace for the rest of my life. There's kind of a joke, uh, there's a meme that I used to see all the time. It's like, they say money doesn't buy you happiness, but it it sure helps, and it's like a guy driving a jet ski. Um, But jet skis break down. And Jesus would say this about money. He would say, why do you build up treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy? but instead build up treasures in heavens where those things can't affect the treasure I've given to you. 
See, here's why our hope and security and safety doesn't need to be found in some sort of status of money or resources. Because our status and security is in an inheritance that we have that's in eternity with Christ. And no amount of money can buy you that. And when we get to heaven, we're going to study heaven. I meant to mention this. Uh, well, I don't know, it depends on what the hurricane does this week if we start this week, but we're going to do like a six-week study on heaven and what that means. And here's what's going to happen when we get to heaven. There will be people who were dirt poor, who will be significantly in the most amazing place of treasure and joy and peace than the people who were insanely wealthy in this life. Because the inheritance that we have in eternity is rooted in the work of Christ, not your, your tax status. And so when we put our hope and security in that, it just leaves us down. It disappoints us. Here's the last point, principle. Identify it, identify it, identify it. First step. Two, apply the gospel to it. Here's the third one. You and I need to be willing to go to war with our idols. 1 John 5, 2 says, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. If you've read 1 John, 1 John is this amazing book where John talks about the challenges of loving one another in the body of Christ. And what do we do in the body of Christ when somebody says, I'm a follower of Jesus, but then you look at their life and there is nothing that looks like they love Jesus. Like how do we wrestle with that kind of nominal, I'm Christian by name only. And John gives us all sorts of wisdom and how we can go about that. John talks about like not pursuing worldliness, but pursuing Christ. He talks a lot about false teachers in the church and how we should reject what they teach. And then he ends the book. This is the last verse in 1 John where he says, my little children run from idols. And I've heard it said in some of the things that I studied this week is this is, this is John's way of saying we'll never figure out the other things in our lives if we're always making idols and we're not going to war with the idols. So here's what the implications is. You and I cannot be passive about this. The idols of our hearts will not go away organically. <laughs> there has to be a degree in which we go to war with it. Y'all, I know that there are some people when it comes to sins that they struggle with, they've gotten great victory over it. And I've experienced that in some ways, and I hope you as a Christian have experienced that other ways too. But I think one of the problems sometimes when we talk about victory over sin after we know Jesus is we just neglect to communicate to people that are struggling the grind of sanctification. Now, if you know what sanctification is, sanctification is the process by in which God is making us like Jesus. And, and when I was younger, I would go to these camps, and I would go to like these revivals and these like evangelists would come in. It was always the guys that would preach like two or three sermons and they would go and preach the same two or three sermons. They would talk about their sin like they never struggled with it. And they would tell these stories like I came to faith in Jesus and I never did this thing again. And I'm like, well, it is not that way for me. I'm like 16 wrestling with my brokenness and sin. And I'm like frustrated because I'm like, like I want to be like that. And so here's my point, y'all. It would just be a great thing if today you go home and say, this is the idol that I have in my heart. I'm not going to follow it anymore. And you never follow it again. That'd be awesome. Whatever you do, come talk to me because I would love to learn what you do. What I've discovered in my walk with Jesus is you identify the idol in your life and then you spend the rest of your life going to war with your flesh in the power of the Spirit. And there's this everyday battle and grind against the desires of our flesh. And sometimes it is quick and easy and we don't battle with it anymore. But you know what I've discovered in my own walk with Christ? The second I kick that idol and by God's power get rid of it, guess what happens? Another one pops up. And then I'm like, oh man. I jokingly say it's like whack-a-mole, you know? And you just keep going over and over again. Now, now, now here's, here's where all of this hopefully ties together. You guys, I've, I've shared a lot about my own brokenness and my struggles. And so you guys are keenly aware that one of my battles is, is a fear of man where I care more about what people think of me than what God thinks of me. I like to be liked. You know, in Michael Scott's words, I don't have to be liked, but I like to be liked. Um, and the way that manifests itself in my responsibility in the position that I'm in now is like, you guys are all attached to that. So like when people visit our church, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sharing with you the way this is an ongoing battle for me. 
Like when people visit our church and they leave, and maybe they say critical things about our church. When I am making an idol out of the opinions of people, it's crushing to me. Because I feel like it's a reflection of me as the pastor. When somebody says, I don't like this about the branch, or I don't like that about the branch, or I don't like that thing you said in the sermon, it's like devastating for me in ways that is not of God. You know? If somebody ever changes churches, I'm like, it's my fault, I should have did better. You know, I'm like self-deprecating. It's like wrecking to me. Now, Now, here's my point. I would love the day that I don't care about those things. But what I've discovered is every single day I have to wake up. And I have to say, God, you are my king. You are my Lord. I want to please you. I don't care what visitors think of our church. I do care what visitors think of our church. But I don't need to idolize it. Does that make sense? Y'all, it is good for churches to value how people see and perceive their church when they come. That's a good thing. But I just told you, I make an idol out of it sometimes. Where in my heart, there are times I would rather visitors like our church than to be found faithful to what God has called me to be. And that's my battle. And so every day, it seems as if I just have to go to war with it. And sometimes it's not every day. Sometimes it's like once a week. But it's an ongoing struggle and battle for me. And I heard a guy named Matt Chandler say it like this. He said, we as Christians sometimes just need to put sin to death. And in Matt Chandler's kind of like strong way, he's like, here's what that means, man. You need to drag it outside and shoot it and kill it and crucify it. Don't play games with it. Go to war with it. And so I've discovered over the years that this is a struggle and a battle, but here's the key. If we do not go to war with our idols, we will look like this family. Our families as followers of Jesus will have large areas in our lives where we take idols and we set it there and we worship it And we miscommunicate who the God is of the universe because we give the affections of our heart to that. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my relationship with Christ or my household to look like Micah in this text. I want it to reflect God's goodness and his kindness. All right, go to verse 6. I want to read verse 6 with you guys. Key verse for the whole book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel... And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So here's what verse 6 does. Verse 6 is inserted by the the writer to help us understand why things were so messy in Israel. And what it's saying is the messiness in Micah's home was because the culture of that time was there was no king, there was no leader, so everybody's doing what they feel like is right. Everybody is just following their, their hearts. And because they follow their hearts, their hearts are deceptive and lie to them, and so they're worshiping all of these other idols. And I think this is a warning to us. It's a warning to say that you and I do not need to follow our hearts. We need to follow Jesus. I'm thinking about, like, like here's an example. If you take a teenager that may be, or a college student that is, is in the dating scene, and they're like, I really like this person. I'm like, I might think I might love them, you know? Uh, And their heart is like, I need to be with them. But sometimes as a pastor, you see the dynamic of that relationship and you're like, that's not God's will for your life. It's clear in like 10 ways. But that young person is so struggling because in their heart, that's just what they want. And and what this text is saying is all throughout Israel, the pattern is people just did whatever they felt like was right at no regard for God's truth. And what you and I need is not to follow our hearts. We need to follow Jesus. So I'm going to ask Andrew to come back up. We're going to close out in a song here in just a second. But but check this out, okay? Here's what I discovered. In the book of Judges, they worship idols over and over and over again because there is no king. During the time of Moses, which chronologically is before the book of Judges, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, right? Gets the Ten Commandments. He comes down. Guess what they're doing? Worshiping idols. At the end of the book of Judges in 1 Samuel, God gives them a king, a guy by the name of Saul, then they get David, then they get Solomon. By the time Solomon dies, this is so huge, virtually every single king after Solomon leads the entire nation of Israel to worship idols. 
Now, now here's my point. What this text is saying is when the people just govern themselves, they worship idols. What the whole Old Testament teaches is even when they have a king, guess what they do? They worship idols. So that old hymn is right. You and I are prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. We're prone to lead the God I love. But I want to tell you there is good news in the scriptures. The pattern is people wander from God and they make idols. But the other pattern is, is Jesus loves idolatrous peoples. That Jesus has come to die and to rescue sinners who have pursued those things. Which is why you and I follow Jesus, because we know that he actually is better than that idol. We know that he has saved us and redeemed us and loved us on our worst days, knowing the worst things that we've done. And so I want to follow Jesus, not the idols that my heart makes. So I want to pray for us as I close our time out. Let me encourage you, if you have not wrestled through what the idol is that enslaves you, to wrestle through that. And maybe at some point, if you want to talk to a pastor about how to identify the idol and wrestle through that, uh, I'd love to talk to you about that and peel that on your back. And so let's pray. Jesus, you know the heart of every single person that's here. And you know the idol of every single heart. So I pray in your kindness to every person in this room that you would be just so gracious that your spirit supernaturally would illuminate like a giant spotlight on the idol of their heart. But in your grace, you would not just leave them there knowing what it is, but you would push them to a deeper understanding of your death and your resurrection. So God, we need your help. We want to follow you and serve you to the ends of the earth. And I know in my own heart and the hearts of every believer here, we won't do that if we're always chasing after the idols of this world and this life. So God, I just pray that you'd bless this time of reflection and closing the service out and singing. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.